Our gospel passage is from the book of Matthew. This is chapter 24, verses 36 through 44. You got Luke here. Hmm? You got Luke here. Oh, did I? Whoops. Yeah, it is Matthew. It's Matthew. Okay. Yeah. Take well. <laughs> but about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would, and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Every year, Advent begins with a reminder, and it's not a gentle reminder. Every year on the first Sunday of Advent, we read a passage from the synoptic apocalypse. And this is where Jesus teaches about the eschaton or the end, um, or maybe it would be better described as the end of the beginning. Um, and that's the moment when Jesus will return to the earth. And <clears throat> for me, it's always a bit jarring. I don't know about all of you, um, but I also think that that's part of the point. Um, because during the Christmas season, during Advent, um, what we're doing is looking backwards. Um, we commemorate and we celebrate an event that has already happened, uh, the birth of Jesus and the incarnation. And while that is good and it's necessary to celebrate Jesus's birth, um, there is actually a risk involved. And the risk is that by looking backwards and memorializing a past event, um, it can become trapped in the past. Um, and the thing we are celebrating can become stagnant and lifeless. Um, something that has already happened, something that is over. And the first week of Advent reminds us that we are actually in the story right now. Um, the story um, in the Bible is not over. It is happening, it is happening, and it is moving towards something. And I think this is hard for us to remember, that history is moving in a particular direction. Um, and it's hard, honestly, to believe that, um, that history is going somewhere. And it's hard to believe, partly because Jesus said it so long ago, um, and it hasn't happened, at least the way that he describes it. Um, but it was hard even for the people who were living in Matthew's day, Matthew who wrote this gospel. So Matthew's gospel was written probably sometime around the year 80. So Jesus had been gone for around 50 years at this point. And scholars think that at least some Christians were wondering, okay, it's been 50 years. Is this actually going to happen? And Matthew's version of this apocalyptic part of the gospel is the longest of the three. So um, it's the longest of Mark, Matthew, and Luke. And this might be because he was trying to reignite this expectation. Um, for people who had been waiting for what to them felt like a really long time. 
They thought that Jesus was going to come back pretty quickly after his ascension, but it did not happen that way. And so Matthew puts a particularly strong emphasis on eschatology or the end. Um, he doesn't want Christians to give up hope or to lose faith in Jesus's promise that he is going to return. Um, just out of, for the sake of my own curiosity, how many people here um, grew up in a church or attended a church or were part of some sort of faith community that put a lot of emphasis on the end times? Anybody? Terry? <laughs> You're like, yeah, sort of. Yeah. Um, do you feel like they did a good job? No? Um, or in a way that was helpful or that encouraged your faith? No, okay. No. And um, the reason I ask is because that I do think in some traditions, um, it has been used primarily to scare people. Um, to scare people into what I think of as basically behaving. Um, and it's true, I think, to me, this part of the gospel does use fear to motivate people. Um, Jesus uses the imagery, for example, of the flood, right? A disaster um, to describe what his return is going to be like. Um, he says people are going to disappear um, and that waiting for his return is like staying awake all night to be ready for when the thief comes to try to break into your house. Um, because he will come and it will be at an unexpected time. Um, and then actually we didn't read this, but then Jesus goes on to tell a series of parables about readiness and watchfulness and they're scary. Um, and, you know, as I was reading this, um, this passage over the, the last couple of weeks, you know, I sort of started to realize that I was resenting it and resenting um, the use of fear to try to motivate me. Um, when someone tries to get me to do something or to behave a certain way by threatening me, by scaring me, um, my instinct is actually to do the opposite of what they want me to do. <laughs> um, and yeah, sure, that is probably immature on my part, but it's my natural reaction. And Jesus's use of fear in this section, it also kind of confuses me because in the gospels, he talks a lot about um, transformation and our hearts being transformed. Um, he says, for example, that the greatest commandments, um, they're about love. Um, he says that we should be merciful towards each other, um, that we should forgive each other quickly and easily, et cetera, et cetera. And, to me, it seems unlikely that fear of punishment leads to this kind of transformation of the heart. Um, fear, I think, makes us clench up. Um, but Jesus seems to want us to open up to, to God, to him, to other people, and to the Holy Spirit. And I'm not sure fear helps us to do that. And I also wonder, can our love for God be true and be real if it is coerced primarily through fear. Um, I understand that fear can motivate people to behave and be good, um, but I don't think behaving is really the message of the gospel um, or the kingdom of God. But the passages still do make me uneasy. <laughs> Can't get around that. They do scare me. Um, and, you know, on the positive side, they remind me that my life and what I do with my life, how I treat other people, um, where I place my priorities, these things matter a great deal to God and to Jesus. Uh, they carry real weight. And that is a responsibility, but it's also incredibly humbling to think that God cares about our lives. Honestly, the best I can do with these passages is admit that I do not know how to harmonize them 
with other things that Jesus says about God. Um, I don't know how to bring those together and, and make them exist without tension. Um, the best I can do is try to hold them together in tension and honestly just to admit that I do not understand the mind of God. But I choose to trust God and to trust Jesus. And um, I think a lot of the fear that we, that we feel in these passages comes from the fact there is a lot of unexpectedness built into it, right? So Jesus says, you don't know when it's going to happen, so be on your toes all the time. Um, and I think that this uncertainty and the anxiety or the fear that it produces, um, it might have the opposite of the intended effect, right? It might lead us to avoid these parts of the gospel. It might even cause us to avoid God or Jesus, um, but that's not helpful. Um, avoidance, honestly, it only leads to more anxiety. Um, so there is a lot of unexpectedness in these passages, but I think um, what we do know is that it is Jesus who is going to be returning. Um, and it is Jesus who will be the judge. And instead of avoiding him, we are invited to actually know Jesus. Um, so in the Gospel of John, Jesus calls his followers his friends. Um, he washes their feet. He heals the sick. He comforts the brokenhearted. Um, he comes to proclaim that the prisoners are free. And he says, I am with you right now and until the very end of the age. And what this means is that Jesus wants to know us. Jesus does know us, um, but also vice versa. Jesus wants us to know him, to become accustomed to his character. Um, and when the end comes, whenever that is, we will not be meeting a stranger. Um, at least we don't have to meet him that way. He invites us to get to know him now. And so my advice when these kinds of patches, passages um, create inner conflict or fear or anxiety, my advice is to seek Jesus out. Um, because the closer we grow to him and the more we experience his love for us, the better we know him, then the more we trust him as a comforter, as a healer, but also as a judge. <laughs>